Hey everyone, I'm Mind, and LEGO just released the first 12 episodes of Ninjago Crystallized. I was not expecting to wake up to this at all this morning, you may have saw they also released the trailer for Crystallized this morning, and LEGO actually sent that one to me early to prep videos for it, so like I knew the trailer was coming this morning, so like nowhere did I think, oh, maybe the episodes were released today too, but no, somehow they released the first 12 episodes as well as the trailer today, which seems a little counterintuitive, but regardless, they're here and I just want to talk about them. Now, if you guys want to watch the episodes for yourself, they're actually on LEGO's official YouTube channel. However, I believe they're only on LEGO's YouTube channel in the US, so if you're in another country, you can use like a VPN or something to get into the US. But I think in other countries it's going to air on actual TV stations, it's just on YouTube in the US. But regardless, I'm so happy these episodes are finally here. I am going to talk about spoilers a little bit, but I'll give you a little bit of a spoiler for your review first. First off, I think this is one of Ninjago's best seasons already, like I know I'm riding off that initial hype. But no, the characterization of all the characters is so well done, everybody feels like themselves again. Characters like Jay and Zane and Kai I feel like have been underutilized in like the wild brain era of Ninjago. I feel like they haven't necessarily been themselves. They've been sort of reduced down to more two-dimensional versions of themselves. But no, there's really great moments in these episodes that show like these are still the same characters we know and love. And there's a lot of callbacks to like Wilfilm Ninjago. And it really feels like this is the same series, which makes me so happy to see. The plot is also engaging and fun, there's not really any filler, like there's a few scenes that are probably unnecessary but those are goofy fun, and they all do help to further the story which is what's important. There were so many moments watching these where I was just gasping and like just laughing out loud in just excitement. It made me feel like a kid again, like genuinely these are some of the coolest episodes of Ninjago I've ever watched. And I think this might end up being my favorite season when it's finished, but of course I have to see how they resolve it. Because only the first 12 episodes are out, I believe it's confirmed we're getting 30. But yeah, I'm very curious what the release cycle is going to be like for the episodes going forward. But anyway, yeah, of course, I recommend you guys watch these. They're super great. But now I am going to get into spoiler talk, so if you haven't watched the episodes yet, you might want to click off the video now. But if you don't care about spoilers or you've already seen the episodes, let's get into it. So starting with the first episode, I think this was a great start. You see Miss Demeanor. She's actually got like a lot going on this season, which was super cool to see. We also get introduced to the new ninja here, and they're such like goofy characters. I think these are very much going to be played up for the jokes in this season. I know a few people, myself included, were theorizing like, oh, maybe these will become the main ninja after this season. But after seeing how much these are very much Joe characters, I find that hard to believe. But we learn that they're hired by the mayor and whatnot. Actually, I don't know if we learned that in this episode, but yeah, that we learned the new ninja are hired by the mayor. And then we go into like tackling how the different ninja are handling the grief of losing Nia. And I think this is just so well done. Like every single moment in this episode hits so hard, especially when Zane's talking about how he disabled his emotions because he didn't want to deal with the grief. That was just, wow, it was just so impactful, it was so good. And then we get like our first look at the new mayor and everything, and I think it's super cool that they teased this all the way back in March of the Oni, talking about how the old mayor didn't really do anything, and now they finally have a new mayor and he's doing something. And that's like a great like way to explain why all this is happening, why the mayor's never stepped in before, it's because the old mayor didn't care, but this one does. And then seeing how all the different characters are like going through dealing with Neo, Wu is like frantically trying to find some way to bring her back. Kai has just become really brutal and he like doesn't want to show mercy to any villains so he's teaching these kids to just destroy their enemies. Lloyd being a window cleaner is uh, a little bit weird, I don't know how I feel about that one. It makes sense that Lloyd sort of blames himself because he's supposed to be the leader of the team and he let Nia sacrifice herself. But yeah, window cleaner, I don't know if that's what I see Lloyd doing. I feel like Lloyd, especially after what he did in um, Rebooted, I feel like Lloyd wouldn't really do this. But that's a minor thing and he obviously, he comes around pretty quickly so I don't really mind that. And then Jay in the lighthouse, this was just such a heartfelt scene, it was just, wow. I, I absolutely loved this. It's weird that we, they don't really expand on the fact that this is the lighthouse or anything, and obviously we don't see Echo Zane here, and we'll get into this more as we talk about episode 12. I think Echo Zane might actually be Mr. E this season, which is super cool. But yeah, all the little lanterns going through the water, and then Jay picking it up, and everything, like yeah, that was... Wow, it was just such a strong start to the season. It was also interesting because it was very, like, somber, right? There was no cool action moments to get you going. I guess maybe except for the very intro with the new ninja. I guess that's why that was there. But with the main team, like, yeah, it was just very sad. But I really love that they started it like that. Then episode 2, The Call of Home, this was an entire knee episode, and this thing made me cry. And I was like, oh no, episode 2 and they're already making me cry, but the flashback scene in this, like, was really touching, and Nia just, like, slowly finding herself again, interacting with Nyad, that's super cool that the two of them met up, and it shows that, like, Nyad is still around and everything. That was, like, amazing, and yeah, just her reading all the lamps, I was tearing up during it. <laughs> and then I really liked, too, how in the flashback, they actually had, a. Uh, animation from Master of Spinjitzu in there. They had animation from um, Skybound, which was really cool to see the callback to that, because I remember back in uh, back in Season 11 when Zane regained his memories, 
I thought it was really lame how they didn't include any, like, season 1 through 10 footage, because Zane's, like, remembering his time with the others, but it's all just, like, the past few months. It's nothing from the past, like, none of the major moments in his life. So that scene always felt really off to me, but no, like, this was a huge improvement. I'm really glad they had Skybound footage in there. But yeah, so then she visits the Lighthouse, but she struggles being out of water, but she still wants to, like, find a way to get back to the ninja. This was just so, so cool, and, like, really touching and everything. Yeah, I think this was super well done. Then episode 3, I love seeing the team, like, struggling to come back together. The way they're not just, like, working together. It's not just, like, oh, we agreed to work together, so now everything's fine. Like, no, they're still, they're still clearly, like, struggling. Jay and Kai especially are butting heads a lot. They're both dealing with losing Nia in different ways, and, like, they're not very coordinated when fighting. I think this was awesome, like, this entire episode. The characters actually feel like people. They don't feel like these overpowered beings. And then the very end here, I'm actually going to play this clip for you guys. We're all dealing with losing Nia differently. Right. Some of us are even talking to glasses of water. Uh, ah, Nia! Look what you did, you, you clumsy! Jay, sorry, I didn't... Like that. That was awesome. That's a side of Jay we have never seen. Because he's always, like, very happy and goofy. But seeing Jay get so angry, he actually attacks Kai. That was crazy. And you can see Kai was genuinely apologetic. He, like, he's upset with Jay for the way Jay's been acting. But you can see he does apologize for knocking over the water. But Jay's just so angry. Like, that, this is so cool. The emotions we see here, it's just so well done. And then the two of them fighting. Such a violent display of emotions is unbefitting a team. Then maybe we shouldn't even be a team anymore! Like, this is just sick. <laughs> and yeah, then Nia comes back, and I really like how Zane froze her. I think that's a cool way to, like, explain her, like, being stuck in place right there. I don't know, I like that all the ninja had something to do. And then they start discussing plans on, like, how to save her. And I like the way that Wu's not entirely for it, but the rest of them, there's a scene at the very end, right? All in favor of going after immediately, they're all immediately like, I don't care if it's against the wall, I don't care what it takes, I will bring Nia back. And that, I don't know, that's just really powerful. Episode 4, they go to the mayor first, and he's like, no, of course we're not letting Esfir out of jail, what are you, crazy? So then they go and try to break in themselves. Lots of cool moments, it's all very goofy, but I think it's super well done just watching the break in and everything. And yeah, then they get Asphira out. I do I do wonder, like, to get Nia's powers, I do wonder why they chose to go to Asphira. Because in theory, they do know two other ways to steal em elemental powers, right? They, they could have gone to Skylar to talk about the, um, the stuff that Chen used to steal the elemental powers during, uh, Season 4. Or they could have gone to Rey and Maya to find out about Chrono Steel, because they previously forged weapons out of Chrono Steel to steal Crux and Chronix's powers. So I think the ninja could have done that here. I get Asphira needs to be unleashed just for the plot of the season. But they did a pretty good job of explaining like everything else, why they did the things they did. So I find it weird they don't really address why they needed Asphira and not one of the other options. But yeah, it's super cool to see Asphira again. Her personality is always hilarious. Like I just love this character and I'm glad to see her in the show again. Oh, and Skylar's back too this episode, and I like how her elemental power here doesn't feel that overpowered, like it runs out after a certain amount of time. I think that's super nice to see. Episode 5, we have Asphira coming back to the monastery, and then the ninja trying to break into the truck, right? Yeah. I'm gonna be completely honest, the ninja were kind of wrong for this one. I don't know why they didn't wait for the uh, truck to get to its destination before robbing it. Like, what they do here is very dangerous, and I don't necessarily blame the, uh, blame the mayor for getting angry at them for this, because yeah, this was a little ridiculous what they did here. But regardless, it was a very fun sequence, and they do get out with the staff at the end, albeit after causing a lot of destruction. And you do see them fighting the new ninja here, which is super cool, too. Episode 6, this has, like, the only bit of actual filler that I would call, and it's not even really filler, but it's sort of, like, a goofy, like, little bit to break up the, uh, I guess, the sad tone of the season so far. But you have the bit where, like, Wu and Asphira are competing in, like, really menial competitions, which I do think was fun. It just felt sort of out of place with everything else. But you also get the golden weapons teased here, and you get Esphere just walking around. Lots of Woo and Esphere interactions, which are very cool. I do really like this character. I feel like Season 11 did do her a little bit dirty. But Esphere is a great character, and I cannot wait to see more from her this season. Then, of course, she immediately betrays everybody, because of course she does. But then the cops arrive. And then just seeing her sucking the uh, powers out of Nia, that was super cool. And then at the very end, that's the best part of this episode. I hope it was worth it, criminal. It was. Like, that's just so good. That's so good. And then at the very end, this part right here. So, this is happening? Yeah, but we did it. Just the way they're like... 
they're all smiling about this. That's, I love it. I just, I love that so much. And then of course we see Asphira get invited to the um, Council of the Crystal King. Super, super cool. Episode 7, lots of great Dareth moments here. I don't like the new Dareth face this season. I don't know why I have it to all of his distinctive facial features. But he just looks so generic and I kind of hate it. <laughs> but he is still very funny in this episode. Seeing the ninja interact with all the different villains in prison was fun, and like getting this new character teased right here that was just so ominous and freaky. Really loved that. And then yeah, at the end we see the Skull Sorcerer get invited to the council. In episode 8, you see Nia finally a little bit again. I feel like she's not been in this season very much. I'm hoping on the latter half of the season we see her a little bit more, because we haven't really like gotten to see her react to being back, being human again. But you see her a little bit here, like, going through her grief in the Neo way that she does. But then we see some, like, really heartfelt, like, fan letters talking about how much they appreciate her being Samurai X. And she gets the idea to make a new Samurai X and that can become Samurai X again. We also see Pythor for the first time in ages. He name drops the Crystal King. Talks about how the new ninja were the ones that arrested him. And this was just such a cool scene. He just feels like Pythor again. This characterization is perfect. Even though it's been years since we last saw him, this is so much better than he was in Day of the Departed. And yeah, then he gets invited to the council and then Lloyd chases him down. But obviously, uh, Pythor gets away. But the uh, ninja do not get away with him. And while this episode didn't really drop any major bombshells, I think it was still a very fun one. It helped really like further the plot. Then we have Hound Dog McBrag, which is a new cop character that's introduced this season. I love the interaction between Jay and Fuji Dove. They're so funny. I love that Fuji Dove has this bigger role this season, and it looks like he's gone after a few episodes. But the episodes he's in are wonderful, and just the way that Jay cannot stand him is so funny. Seeing Nia in the new Samurai X mech is super cool, too. Really glad to see like that, and I hope we do see more of it later in the season. So far, the mayor seems like a really good character, too. Obviously, he's obnoxious, but that makes for a very good villain. And then there's just the uh, car chase where Dara's trying to get away from the police. And then here is Hound Dog McBrag. What a great character. And then at the very end, they decide to split up because they feel like that's the best option. I do wonder why they did that because it doesn't seem to pay off that much, but it does lead to a very, very good episode, so I actually don't mind. Because episode 10, The Benefit of Grief, is one of Ninjago's best episodes ever, genuinely. It's not like the coolest or like most action-packed, but just the themes they touch on here are so just nice. Talking about like how it's okay to grieve, this new character of Sally I really, really loved. And just everything done here, it's just done in such a tasteful way. And it really gives so much more depth and emotion to Kai and to Zane, and even to Dareth, honestly. Just seeing the way they support her and everything, and seeing Zane at the very end go, okay, grieving is okay, I have to do it. Like that, it's just wonderful. It's such a heartfelt and like really nice episode. And I think this is probably one of my favorite ones of this batch released. It's so well done overall, genuinely. I really love that Ninjago's not afraid to do episodes like this, because it's not Ninja fighting bad guys the entire time. It is a more heartfelt, chiller story, but that's okay, because it turned out fantastic. Then episode 11, the fifth villain, I find it's weird that this is called the fifth villain, because at this point we don't know about the fourth villain, which is Mr. E. We do learn about him in the uh, next episode. But yeah, I think the episode title here is a little funny. But anyway, so the other four make it back to Twitchy Tim's house. This entire sequence is hilarious, the way they're all hiding, and then Twitchy Tim's just like, yeah, they're right over there. But then Fuji Dove's the one that saves the day, and they're able to get out. That was just wonderful. And I like seeing Twitchy Tim back, too. Also, the ninja have their new ninja suits. I think they got them two episodes ago. Super cool to see those in the show. And then the fight scene with the mechanic where they break back into his headquarters. That was super cool. The animation in this one was really sick. I like how he has, like, Doc Ock-type arms. And then they tie up the mechanic, put Lloyd in place of the mechanic to go infiltrate the Crystal King's base. Something very funny is I feel like a lot of this season, Tommy Andreasen is just talking directly to the audience and saying, please stop asking me questions on Twitter. Because there's been a few times where something is done where I've thought it's like, oh, hey, why didn't they just do that? And then a few si scenes later, they'll explain, oh, here's why we didn't just do that. Which is cool that they are explaining things, but these are the kind of things that people would always ask Tommy on Twitter, so I feel like that's why that's happened. Like, it happened in the episode where they were going to get the uh, staff of Asphira. Somebody says something like, oh, we can't just call Cyrus Borg and ask for it, and then Pixel goes and calls Cyrus Borg and asks for it. And I think that's really funny, because, yeah, people would be like, I thought Cyrus Borg was their friends, why can't they just call? So they did do that. And then this episode, they're like, why didn't Zane just use his cloaking device, which was a thought I had. But they're like, oh, Zane has to stick back here so that we can track Lloyd on the GPS, which I guess makes sense. But yeah, this episode's great. You see Lloyd enter the uh, Temple of the Crystal King. Uh, obviously, the mechanic breaks out, which this is a pretty cool fight scene. 
But then Lloyd gets in the Crystal King's lair and you can see these are the Vengestone warriors that come in the sets. But here they're not like covered in crystals, they are completely made of Vengestone. And I think that pretty much confirms that yeah, the Overlord is most likely the Vengestone buyer. There's been a million sides pointing to it, but these are essentially stone warriors made out of Vengestone. Obviously these stone warriors were the Overlord's original army. So it would make sense if he's like, oh, to make them even better, they're going to be made of Vengestone so that the ninja can't fight back. Because if you remember, these stone warriors' only weakness was elemental powers. So in theory, the Vengestone warriors will have no weakness. They'll just be overpowered, which is very, very cool. But yeah, then Lloyd gets in the chamber, and I love the interaction between all the different villains. We also see Mr. F for the first time here. And yeah, this is such a cool outfit for him. I really hope we get that as a minifigure one day. Because that, like, Iron Man-style core in the middle and, like, the purple lights running up him, that looks sick. The time for revenge is at hand. Revenge. 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 What? What, what? What did you say? I don't know. What did I say? I love that interaction, the interaction between Pythor and Esphere. Both of them are so good this season, I really hope they interact more, because they're just two very funny characters. And then finally, the way this episode ends off, just wow. I was gasping, and I just, like, I, I could not believe what was happening as soon as this started, but I'll just play it for you guys. Can't you guess? Can't you feel it, Lloyd? Can't you sense it? Uh, I'll give you a clue. Spiders in the house sleep, sleep. Spider in the mouse sleep, deep. No, Don't I can't wait to find a spider in the mouth. And then it ends on that song for the credits. Like, what? What is happening? <laughs> That's crazy. Like, oh my goodness. So, obviously, yeah, this person was Harumi the entire time, apparently. Very interesting, and I'm so excited to see, like, where they go with that. Like, how is she back? Is that really her? That was such a cool reveal. I am hesitant on the idea of Harumi coming back. However, I do have faith in the writers. I think Harumi's story was ended perfectly and hunted, and she really shouldn't be brought back as Harumi. However, I do have faith that if they are bringing her back, they could do it well. I do have a feeling that this isn't actually Harumi and this is actually just someone messing with Lloyd. Because I do kind of still like that theory that this is some sort of shapeshifter. Because you may notice the eyes in the mask are very similar to the eyes on the rat in the one trailer that we saw and like one of the earlier episodes. So if this is a shapeshifter, such as Camille or one of the Oni, it would make sense that they shapeshifted into Harumi just to mess with Lloyd a little bit. But yeah, still regardless, it's very cool to see Harumi again. As much as I'm like, yeah, I don't want her to come back, I love how her story ended, I adore this character and just seeing her again makes me so happy. Like, this is so cool. Like, look how cool that is. That's, I don't know, I'm a fan. I just, I can't help but get excited even if I'm like, this might be, this might be a bad thing in the long run. It's just so cool to see her back. But yeah, as a whole, I enjoy these episodes so much. I'm so excited for like what this season has to offer. Already, it's probably one of my favorite Ninjago seasons, and it's just getting started. Very curious what the release schedule is going to be like. I hope it doesn't continue to be 12 episodes at once, because that is a lot. I hope they go like two episodes a week after this. That would be pretty cool. But regardless, this like this is awesome. I absolutely love this. I'm glad we have more Ninjago content, and this is some of the best Ninjago content we've ever gotten. Let me know in the comments what you guys have thought of these episodes, any theories you have, and I'm sure I will talk about all of this in a lot more depth in the Woo Crew podcast this week when I talk to Matthew, but I just want to make a short video just talking about it, giving my initial impression, because yeah, I've been, I watched all this and I just needed to talk about it because it was just so cool. But that's about going to do it for this video. Thanks for watching, everybody. If you enjoyed, please press like, subscribe to the channel if you're new, go check out my early 2022 Ninjago reviews if you haven't yet, card in the top right corner probably. Thanks for watching, everybody, and I will see you all in the next one. Bye.